Today we're going to discuss the theory of groupthink. Groupthink is based on the research by Irving Janis. His book, entitled Victims of Groupthink from 1972, was on this topic. Groupthink is a way of deliberating that group members use when their desire for unanimity overrides their motivation to assess all available plans of actions. Members tend to deliberate in which the consensus seeking outweighs good sense. Consensus seeking is the need for everyone to agree. Also, groups tend to achieve a goal or task is more important than coming to a reasonable solution. When highly similar groups and agreeable groups fail to consider fully any dissenting opinions, when they express conflict just so they can get along, or when the group members do not consider all solutions, they are prone to groupthink. Irving Genesis' book, Victims of Groupthink, in 1972, listed five important national matters that were examples of groupthink. These matters included the preparedness policies of U.S. Navy at Pearl Harbor in 1941, the decision to pursue North Korean Army on its own territory by President Eisenhower, the decision by President Kennedy to invade Cuba at the Bay of Pigs after Fidel Castro established a communist government, the decision to continue the Vietnam War by President Johnson, and the Watergate cover-up by President Nixon. All of these policies were made by these presidents and their team of advisors while under some, some degree of stress, and these decisions were made hasty and inaccurately. So the theory of groupthink. There are two types of groups within groupthink. The first is the problem-solving groups. These are sets of individuals whose main task is to maintain decisions and provide recommendations. The second group is the task-oriented groups. These are sets of individuals whose main goal is to work towards completing these assigned tasks. There are three assumptions of groupthink. The first assumption is that co conditions in groups promote cohesiveness. The second assumption is that group problem solving tends to be a unified process. And the third is that groups and group decision making tend to be complex. Each of these components are going to be discussed further in the following slides. The first one, conditions in groups promote high cohesiveness. Members have a common sentiment or investment and tend to maintain a group identity. Also, the members tend to solidify that group will be agreeable and highly cohesive. Though cohesiveness is the cultural value that places emphasis on the group over the individual person. This is the extent to which group members are willing to work together. The second assumption is that group problem solving is a primarily a unified process. Problem solving in small groups is a unified undertaking. People tend to not want to disrupt decision making when they're in those small groups. They strive to get along. However, they're susceptible to affiliati affiliative constraints. These affiliative constraints are when the members withhold their input rather than face rejection from the group. They tend to follow the leader approach when it comes to making a decision. The third assumption is that groups and group decision making tend to be complex. It underscores the nature of most problem solving and task oriented groups to which people belong. They are usually complex. To further understand, we must look at the complexity and decisions emerging from these groups. There's two components, the small group members and the group dynamics that are complex and challenging. So first, the small group members. The small group members continue to understand that many alternatives are available to them. They distinguish among these alternatives. They understand the task at hand, and they understand the people who provide input into the task. However, there are some influences that will exist in these small groups. These influences tend to be the age of the group members, the competitive nature of the group members, the size of the group itself, the intelligence of the group members, the, compos the gender composition of the group, the leadership styles within the group, and the cultural backgrounds. The second component is the group dynamics that are ever-changing, challenging, and complex. The first one of these is the problem solving. The groups, the groups are better at problem solving than the individuals themselves. Within a group, they tend to have more information provided. There's also a higher level of commitment toward the group. And lastly, the group will attempt to achieve goals quicker and more efficiently. Within groupthink, there are two issues that are important examples regarding groupthink. First, 
is the, similar, the similarity of the members themselves. This homogeneity is what is considered the group similarity. Second is the group decisions. The group decisions that are not thoughtfully considered by everyone may facilitate groupthink. Quality of effort and quality of thinking are essential in this aspect. Now we're going to discuss some conditions that promote groupthink. There are three main conditions. The first is high cohesiveness of the decision-making group. The second is specific structural characteristics of the environment in which the group functions. And third is the stressful internal and external characteristics of the situation. Each of these will be discussed further and in great detail. So first, let's talk about the group cohesiveness. How does this lead to groupthink? First, we want to say that it differs from one group to another and different levels have different results. It can lead to positive feelings about group experience and other group members, and highly cohesive groups may be more enthusiastic and feel empowered to take on additional tasks. Greater satisfaction is associated with increased cohesiveness. Highly cohesive groups will exert great pressure on members to conform to the group standards. The euphoria can tend to stifle opinions and the alternatives. There is an unwillingness to express conflict conflicting opinions, and the group members tend to censor their own comments. However, as a side note, Janice did say that cohesion doesn't automatically lead to groupthink. It is a necessary ingredient if a group wants to arrive at a thoughtful, inclusive, and informed decision. So the next component is the structural factors. The structural characteristics and faults that promote groupthink. There are four main structural factors. The first is the insulation of the group. Group insulation is when group's ability to be unaffected by the outside world and its happenings. It's easy to occur if members do not solicit out outside opinions or views. The second component is the lack of impartial leadership. This is when the group is led by people who have a personal interest in the outcome of the decision. The third is the lack of decision, the lack of clear procedures for decision making. This is failing to have previously established norms for evaluation of the problems. Groups may recognize there is a problem, but they still must figure out the cause and extent of that problem. They may be influenced by dominant voices and go along with those who speak up. They also may follow what they observed and experienced in previous groups. The homogeneity of members' backgrounds. It's easier for them to concur on whatever proposal is put forth by their leader. So therefore, it's necessary for diversity of background and experience. You need to have this diversity of the background and experience, or otherwise you may not be able to debate critical issues. The next component is group stress. This is the stress on the group. This is influenced by issues, resources, or events both within and external to the group. This is deemed as internal and external stress. High stress is when there's no solution and the group will tend to rally around the leader. The decision makers that are under great stress by external forces may also have faulty decision making. These faulty decisions can occur due to this. And a good example is your work environment. Say for instance you're at your job and your boss comes to you and says that you have to meet a specific deadline. With this specific deadline you can experience internal stress or external stress. The internal stress could come from having to meet that deadline, but you're unable to meet that deadline due to other prior work conflicts or other deadlines that need to be met first. The external stress could be from outside obligations that, are made, that have made you unable to meet those deadlines. These outside obligations could be problems at home, a sick child, or a sick parent that take you away from work, therefore you're unable to meet those deadlines. Janice also concluded that there are symptoms of groupthink. There are eight symptoms that he divided into three categories. First, let's talk about a little bit of the background. There are some pre-existing conditions. These pre-existing conditions lead to concurrent seeking. Concurrent seeking is when the groups try to reach consensus in their final decision. However, by doing this, it can go too far, and therefore, symptoms of groupthink can occur. So the three categories of groupthink are as follows. The first is overestimation of the group, the second is closed-mindedness, and the third is pressures toward uniformity. I'm going to obviously list all three of these, and then I'm going to break these down 
these uh, down into the symptoms for each of these components here. So first, the overestimation of the group. There are two specific symptoms. The overestimation of the group includes behaviors that suggest that the group believe that the group believes is more than it is. So these two specific symptoms are the illusion of invul invulnerability. The illusion of invulnerability is the group's belief that they are special enough to overcome any obstacles or setbacks. The group itself feels like it's invincible. The second one is the inherent morality of the group. This is where they adopt the position that the group is good in a wise group. They assume that the group members are thoughtful and good, therefore the decisions that they make will be good. They then purge themselves of any shame or guilt, although they ignore the ethical and moral implications of their decisions. The next section is the closed-mindedness. The closed-mindedness ignores outside influences on the group. The group's willingness to ignore these differences in people and warnings about the poor group decisions that are being made. This can be broken down into two specific symptoms. The first is the stereotypes of the outgroups. The outgroup stereotypes are stereotype perceptions of groups, enemies, or competition. This underscores the fact that any adversaries are either too weak or too stupid to counter offensive attacks. The second is collective rationalization. This is a situation in which group members ignore warnings about their decisions. They ignore the warnings that might prompt them to reconsider their thoughts or actions before they reach a final decision. They look at this outside warning as bad news. The third is the pressures towards uniformity. This is the go-along-to-get-along approach. This is broken down into four specific symptoms. The first is self-censorship. This is when the group members have a tendency to minimize their doubts and their counter-arguments. They second-guess their own ideas. They silence their own opposing views and using in-group rhetoric further bolster their decisions in the group. The second is the illusion of unanimity. This suggests silence is consent. Therefore, this is the approach of when you don't say anything, you agree. The third is the self-appointed mind guards. This is when group members who shield the group from adverse information. They believe that they act in the group's best interests. Therefore, they're withholding information from the group. And lastly, the direct pressure of dissenters. The pressure on the dissenters is pressuring any group member who expresses opinions, viewpoints, or commitments that are contrary to the majority opinion. Groupthink is all around us. It's on a large scale. This can be either domestic or global political examples, or it can be on a small scale, where it's everyday life, when less critical decisions are being made. One example is whether a student should attend college. A student may have a lot of pressure from family and friends to attend college, but however, they don't look at a different aspect of it of what could be some of the financial burden that is placed upon that student, if the student's able to live on their own, and other examples. So we're going to take a quick break here, and we're going to watch a short video that is an example of groupthink. Having lunch with the plastics was like leaving the actual world and entering girl world. And girl world had a lot of rules. You can't wear a tank top two days in a row, and you can only wear your hair in a ponytail once a week. So I guess you pick today. Oh, and we only wear jeans or track pants on Fridays. Now, if you break any of these rules, you can't sit with us at lunch. Well, I mean, not just you, like any of us. Okay, like if I was wearing jeans today, I would be sitting over there with the art freaks. Oh, and we always vote before we ask someone to eat lunch with us because you have to be considerate of the rest of the group. Well, I mean, you wouldn't buy a skirt without asking your friends first if it looks good on you. I wouldn't. Right. Oh, and it's the same with guys. Like, you may think you like someone, but you could be wrong. 120 calories and 48 calories from fat. What percent is that? Uh, 48 into 120? I'm only eating foods with less than 30% calories from fat. It's 40%. Well, 48 over 120 equals x over 100, and then you cross multiply and get the value of x. Whatever. I'm getting cheese fries. So, have you seen any guys that you think are cute yet? Well, there's this guy in my calculus class. Who is it? It's a senior. His name's Aaron Samuels. <gasps> no. No. No, no, oh, no. You can't like Aaron Samuels. That's Regina's ex-boyfriend. They went out for a year. 
Yeah, and then she was devastated when he broke up with her last summer. I thought she dumped him for Shane Omen. Wait, irregardless, ex-boyfriends are just off-limits to friends. I mean, that's just like the rules of feminism. Don't worry. I'll never tell Regina what you said. It'll be our little secret. So that was an example of groupthink. Now, we're going to talk about ways to present, prevent groupthink. Janice suggested that the best way to prevent groupthink is to engage in vigilant decision making. He first looked at the range of objectives that the group members wished to achieve. Second, he said to develop and review action plans and alternatives. Third, explore the consequence of each alternative. Fourth, analyze previous rejected action plans when new info emerges. And five, have a contingency plan for failed suggestions. Paul Tahart was another researcher, and he believed that Janice's recommendations inadvertently erode collegiality and foster group factionalism. He recommended four general recommendations. These recommendations are require oversight and control, embrace whistleblowing in the group, allow for the objection, and balance consensus and majority rule. We're going to go into these a little bit further. The first one is require oversight and control. This is where you hold key decision makers accountable for their actions before the deliberations actually begin. You want to establish a parliamentary committee, develop resources to proactively monitor ongoing policy ventures, establish incentives to intervene, and link personal fate to fate of group members. The second aspect is embrace the whistleblowing. Whistleblowing is a process in which individuals report unethical or illegal behaviors or practices to others. Therefore, we want to voice doubts. We want to avoid suppressing concerns about group processes, continue to disagree and debate when no satisfactory answers are given, and question any assumptions. The third aspect is allow for objection. Conscientious objectors are members who refuse to participate because it would violate personal conscience. The objectors may be able to raise doubts about the decision or even protest it. Therefore, we want to protect these conscientious objectors. We want to provide for group members' exits, do not play down the moral implications of a course of action, acknowledge private concerns about, uh, about ethical issues in the group. And lastly, he said we should balance consensus and majority rule. Do not require a consensus, but work towards having a majority of the support. We need to alter the rules governing choice, relieve pressure on groups and minority positions, dissuade the development of subgroups, and introduce a multiple advocacy approach to these decisions. So in conclusion, groupthink is a theory that is regarding the understanding of the decision-making process in small groups. Decisions are made with profound consequences.